My name is uh, Stephen Buckingham and I'm a senior teaching fellow at UCL and what I want to talk about this today is, is I want to describe a, a sort of a template or an approach or a design if you like for blended learning and I'll tell you why I think that's important is it's because technology is so central to our lives today. <laughs> right, what's going on here? So um, the question is, you know, what, what do we actually want our undergraduates to accomplish? Because if it comes to, when well, universities all over the place are adopting blended learning, it's not, it's not should, we, should we use blended learning. I think it's becoming clear that we are going to use blended learning for a number of reasons. I think partly because it, it probably is the right way to teach in many ways if you want to accomplish this, which is to get students to take a deep approach to learning. And that, that's the biggest challenge I think universities are facing now, which is, and it has been for quite a while, which is how do we get our students beyond memorising and swatting up for exams and learning things piecemeal and piecemeal, but in a more kind of like a Humboldtian way of saying, getting the students to actually connect things together and to develop as individuals, develop as academics, and, and take this much deeper approach to learning. How do we actually do that? that that's one issue. So that's kind of what we want. When do we want it? Well, we want it now, but in reality, the answer is, is when we have enough staff to spend all the time it takes to get students to think that way. And I think that's the kind of barrier that we're all facing, and we're all aware as educators that if we sit down with students and spend time with them on an individual basis, it's actually much easier to, to move them towards, towards thinking in a deep and connected way, and away from, you know, what do I need for the exams kind of mentality. That's what we want, but it just takes a lot of resources to do it. So I actually think that blended learning is, is a solution to that problem. And I, I'm kind of, I'm really weird because I'm actually a Luddite that even dreams in computer code, right? <laughs> and I'm actually saying that the, the technology is actually a mechanism not for introducing new ways of teaching, that unhappy phrase, but of actually enabling us to go back to the old way of teaching really. So I'm kind of promoting blended learning and the way in which we do it at UCL, particularly the way I do it, as a methodology for going back to good old-fashioned learning. So that's why I put this picture of, of Ludd up there. So we want to be able then to create courses, so we want to blend courses in order to free up staff and so we're not spending our time doing things that computers do a lot better, which is just straightforward delivery of information. And as I've shown in a little while, not just delivering information, but actually teaching can be done online as well. In order that free staff to, to actually work directly with students, because face-to-face -face time is sacred in my, in my thinking. Having that time with the students matters so much in order to get them to do a deep approach to their learning. So when it comes to blended learning, it, it, there's a lot of barriers for us to adopt it. And one, one big barrier is exactly, you know, how do I do it? Because we're, we're used to the idea of, you know, the lectures, the tutorials and the practical classes. It's kind of got a, you know, an institutional history which we're familiar with and comfortable with. And I think one of the barriers is when you say, well, when, how do we actually go about blended learning? What, what do we do and where? First of all, it's not simply about putting PowerPoints up on Moodle. I think we're kind of beyond that. Well, in theory, <laughs> in practice, you know, a lot of universities are boasting, you know, we have a big online presence. We put our PowerPoints on Moodle and maybe even have some turn it in assignments if we're very brave. I think we actually need to take a much more radical approach to that. And a radical approach is actually a lot easier in some ways. So the design principles, if we want to actually accomplish this, are actually quite simple. This is sort of my naive starting point, which is that online you put all your surface learning stuff, right? all your content delivery, so content, con material delivery, content delivery, so your facts, your concepts, your ideas and your skills, that all goes online. So there's really, I think, no place for someone, uh, for a lecturer to spend time telling students facts. I think we're quite clear on that. And then, so all that, all that surface learning is done online. The students go away, they look at, they look at videos, they look at, um, you send them off to go to YouTube, you send them off to, have you heard of Khan Academy? 
absolutely brilliant. It's really, really simple. They just have a screen where someone writes on the screen and talks as they go along. And it's very, very effective. There's tons of stuff out there which point is us doing ourselves if it's already out there. So send the students off to do all this stuff. Tell them where to go. Tell them where not to go, viz Facebook. Right? And just give a bit of guidance. You get all that done online. And students love doing it. They don't have a problem doing that because they do it anyway. We pretend we don't Google and Wikipedia, but we all do. And why not tell the students it's okay to do that in the right way? So that's all done online. And then that, that, that kind of ring fences everything else is then left for face-to-face -face activities, such as problem solving. Our tutorials are problem-based problem tutorials. We don't sit there and say, okay, let's see if you can work out pH yourselves now, because that's all done on the computer. We say, for example, what would happen if the kidney were no longer able to maintain pH? Or this patient has these symptoms. What kidney problem is related to that, for example? Content creation, getting students to make their own stuff. Right? So that can be something as, something as simple as a wiki page or even making their own videos. They love doing it and they're actually really good at it. And inventing things. I mean literally inventing things. First year is inventing things. So this is the sort of stuff that if, I, if, I, if you'd be appointed as a teacher for the first time, this is the sort of stuff you see yourself doing, isn't it? You know, having contact with the students, developing that relationship, and having that kind of very high-level cognitive input to them, helping them develop as academics. But we actually spend a lot of our time down here. So here's the golden rule. Computers do the surface stuff. We do the deep learning stuff. But what I actually found out when we put this into practice was a lot of the deep learning stuff ends up getting done online which actually means you can be incredibly creative up here when you meet your students. Right? So that's all a bit vague and airy-fairy at the moment. So let's, let's look at how it actually works. So I promised you that I'll tell you exactly how to design a blended online course. And the reason I know it can be done in a very short time is because I was just telling Andy, Andy Jones, that um, I was appointed on May the, May the 1st, 2014. And I was told that... Um, uh, we actually need to get a course together. So I said, which course? Which is the entire applied medical sciences degree. Okay, fine. Um, what material have you got already? None. Fine. When do the students come? September. <laughs> so I know it can be done in quite a short time. And this is the sort of design that we've got. So the module then has two domains. Obviously, we've got the face-to-face -face and the online. And what we do is we take the module and divide it up into a number of topics. So 10 to 12 topics. And the idea is that those topics are almost standalone. So you can actually take those topics out and use them in another module if you wanted to. So you build up this kind of like a Lego set of things that you can reuse in different places. So I recommend about 10 to 12. I'm actually really thinking maybe this could actually instead be organised not around topics but around problems. So identifying, for example, with this module, what are the five or six difficult concepts that your students really struggle with? And focus on them and organise the material around those problems. And that's what we're working on at the moment. Each topic has a number of different online activities and there's quite a big menu that you can draw from and choose from and all the ones that we use except for one which I'll show you are standard do you use Moodle here at uh, uh, oh, so, yeah, okay so they're all the standard stuff you get on Moodle which you can just you know, don't need to install any software it's all there but everyone's really afraid of it but for a kind of a nerd like me or a geek I kind of actually like it so once you get into it it's actually quite good so you've got quizzes Storylines you don't have on Moodle, I'll show you those in a minute. Workshops where students actually submit work and, and criticise each other's work. Online tutors, I don't mean me on Skype talking to tutors, I mean programmes that you can write to teach them things like pH or concentrations, that sort of thing. Um, send them off to YouTube, make your own videos and forums, which I'll focus on in a minute. So that's the kind of online activities that you can do. And then that means your face-to-face -face stuff is the interesting stuff. So we actually have a series of inspirational talks where we invite people like Vanessa Branson, the sister of the great uh, Mr. Branson, the one and only, came and talked to us. 
we had Jeffrey Bernstock, who was nominated eight times for a Nobel Prize. He discovered ATP signaling in the brain. He started life as a boxer and was told that because he didn't have the right background, he'd have no future in medicine. But he just made his way in. So we, we give them these inspirational talks just to show them that it's, it's about determination and resilience and all those sort of characteristics which we hope our students will learn by mistake or by osmosis. But we never actually sit down and teach them what these things are. So we do that kind of explicitly there. Our tutorials are very problem-based, so we will give them genuine medical problems. I should sort of emphasize that this is an applied medical sciences degree. We don't teach people to become clinicians. We teach them to be scientists who are brought up in a clinical environment. So people like myself, who came from a science background, when I started looking at Alzheimer's disease, I had no idea what Alzheimer's disease was. I, 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 you know, I knew it was about forgetting things, but, and I knew what the research papers said, but I didn't think like a clinician. Right, so why people are going to think like clinicians? So in the tutorials, we, when, once we talk them about the kidney, for example, we'll say, well, here's a patient who is breathless, who has elevated pH. What, what could be the cause? And they're, they're solving it with the knowledge that they know. Inventions and house blogs, I'm going to cover all these in just a minute. But you get the idea. The, the sort of a nauseous green are deep thinking type exercises or deep learning exercises. The somewhat brighter and almost distinguishable blue from the green are what I consider to be surface activities. Now there's a structure which I think is our most important contribution to this to each of these topics. They're divided into three phases and there's come some good learning pedagogy behind this idea. We start off with a pre-learning phase and then there's a learning phase and a post-learning phase. And the idea is that there's this quote by someone called David Archibald which says that if I had to reduce all of educational psychology to one principle, I would say this the most important single factor in fact, influencing learning is what the learner already knows. Establish this and teach him, her accordingly. So that's the idea behind the pre-learning phase is to get the student and the, and the tutor to understand what the student knows before they do any learning whatsoever. Right? If I were to sit here, I don't know how many biologists here, but if I sit here and go on about you know, the basics of cell organelles, it's irrelevant. You already know it. But if I were to teach, you know, go on about something very specialised, I would have lost you. So I need to know where you are, and you, know, you need to know where you are to, to really learn effectively. So once we've done that, and I'll show you how we do that in just a minute, we then take them through a, the actual content delivery time, kind of like the equivalent of the old-fashioned lectures, and then we finish up afterwards by consolidation. And the idea is that when they come to the post-learning phase, we then start to prepare them by asking them important, carefully designed questions. We start to prepare them to move away from accumulating ideas and facts and concepts to start practicing them and connecting them up with things that they already know. So let's have a bit more detail about that. So in practice, we all know what our beloved Moodle, we all love Moodle, don't we? No? Oh, I wonder why that is. <laughs> The old tab organisation, different ways of organising Moodle, but basically each topic is a tab. So this is a course that I put together on uh, data interpretation and evaluation of science. I wanted to teach them how to use statistics in the context of evaluating science. So I divide up into these sections, what is science? A little bit there about Karl Popper and all those people. Data presentation, why you should never, ever, ever use Excel experimental design and so on. So each topic is one tab. And then if we look a bit more closely, <coughs> yeah, I should say, chip in anybody if you disagree. Or yeah. Right, so it was a plug from the... <laughs> from the revised, <laughs> revised Moodle campaign. So what we do now is we're looking a bit more closely at one of those tabs. And this is what I meant by that structure. We have a preparatory work, and then the learning phase, these storylines, I'll show you those in just a minute. 
And then finally there's the consolidation phase. And the student can see exactly where they're going and how that finally leads up to, in this case, a tutorial, which has nothing to do with giraffes. That was supposed to be something to illustrate, you know, people are talking together. Probably not the best illustration, but there we go. And then some, some activities down there. So a whole structure reminds the student of where they're going and that the big climax is the tutorial. So a little bit closer to the pre-learning phase, and the idea is that to get the students to assess what they already know, so we would simply, we might ask them a question, for example, talking about, say, heart disease, genetics of heart disease, we might simply ask them a very simple question, How, do you know anyone with heart disease? What symptoms did they suffer? What medication did they have? And the questions which are meant to sort of activate what the student already knows, and kind of get the student into the habit of, before studying, to think, well, what do I actually already know about this? And what, I, what do I not know? And what would I like to know? I and mean, sometimes we ask them those questions specifically. What would be a good question about this topic? It, gets, it kind of in, implicitly gets them to do active learning, is what I'm trying to say. The other thing is that we see the quizzes that they fill in as tutors. So we know what they brought to the table, if anything, beforehand. Which means that we can then tailor our tutorials accordingly and we can measure how effective we've been by simply asking the same questions again in the post-learning phase. So I'll try now to show you what some of the... So that they can be very simple quizzes. And if I just look into my Moodle page here... So here we're talking about the quizzes and we might give them a simple pre-learning quiz which will be some very simple questions. Um, none of us would have any difficulty designing a couple of questions like this. So, you know, which is, which is true about epithelia? Now, actually, this is interesting because what I've done here is I've asked them a question which they will not know the answer to necessarily but it points out the fact they don't know. And often we reassure them, don't worry if you don't know the answer to these things. It's a way for you to measure how much you're learning. We sometimes do something a little bit more complicated. And if you look at this, this is an, this is an example from our kidneys module. And it's an example of how we can link what, what they've done before, so their existing knowledge, with what they're about to learn. So I'll just preview this question. I did this question earlier. So, so the idea, what we've got here is these students will have learned the very basics of kidney function and they're now moving on to a second year module where they're learning about the, the, a bit more detail about kidney diseases of the nephron. And what we've got here is a bit like a short answer, question, answer. If that's the right, if that's permissible in the English language. So this will be kind of like a, a short answer question. And what we've done is they've got to fill in these, these missing words. And the trick is, they either know the answer because they did it in their last module, or it's something they can actually take a reasonable guess at based on their general knowledge and what they know about the kidney. And what happens, I did this under, kind of under pressure at a previous talk, and clearly my, my nephritis knowledge requires a little bit of revision, shall we say. But um, the point is, is when they finish this, right, and they generally get it more or less right. They might get one or two things, but when they finish this, they've actually summarised what they're about to learn. So it emphasises that, you know, you can go from what you already know, push yourself forward beyond those horizons a little bit, kind of this Vygotsky idea, and then what you find is you know more than you realise you know, builds up confidence, and when there are gaps here, they'll have those gaps filled in when they come to do the actual, the actual lectures. So another, another kind of activity we, we might do would be to get them to uh, fill in a station opinion. So if I go back to the course I mentioned earlier, where we were trying to teach them about data presentation, it's the wrong one. Here's another example of how we like to, to, to guide them through the whole process. 
in this section, what, the, what they've got to start by doing is that they read a... So what I want, what I want to teach them in this section is, is how to... How the right way to present data, right? How, how to present it clearly, how to make a message. This is before we've shown them how to do it. And they're told, you know, what you've got to do now is you're going to, you're going to read through a report and criticise the way the data are presented. Don't worry about what she's written, just concentrate on the graphics for the minute. They'll read this report, and by this, remember at this stage they've not been told how to make good data, how to present data properly, and they're presented with this awful graph <laughs> of data. And I tried to do everything wrong that I could think of. You know, these silly conical graphics, the back... Basically, just Excel defaults is good enough to produce a, a really bad graphic. And so, but, but then what they do is they, they just from what they were doing, they just criticise this. It's surprising how good they were at spotting, you know, the usual chart junk and the lack of labelled axes and so on. Then when they've done that, when they finish that, they would then go back to reading. They go through these things called storylines, which will show them how to do it. Then when they've done that. They then write a report the right way, so they go back to what they originally thought, going back to that pre-learning stuff, think about what you've just seen in the lectures, now apply it. And that, that could be material which you use in the tutorial. So you see there's a whole connectedness about the whole thing, which I think works quite well. Now I want to tell you a little bit about these storylines because they're, they're quite central to, to the way we teach. They're a sort of an interactive... Um, well, I'm not actually sure what they are. <laughs> Originally we were going to have lecture cast, right? So we we're going to get people to stand up and give a lecture for 45 minutes and record it and that would be basically the lectures. But we thought about that and we said, no, that's rubbish. It's really boring. And watching a, watching a recorded lecture is kind of like watching a recorded party that you weren't actually at. You'll still hear the jokes, but you weren't actually there. And that makes a huge difference. And besides, 45 minutes is really long attention span for the modern young person. Where we were told six minutes maximum. Right? So what we do is we use this software called Articulate Storyline and it produces the kind of like, are they interactive lectures or are they online tutorials? I'll show you what I mean. By the way, um, this is one of the few bits of software that I can recommend which, which you have to pay for because I don't like paying for software. I avoid it most of the time. And it's Windows. So it's kind of, you know... Not something I really wanted to touch too much, but actually it's a really good piece of software, and I'll show you what you can make with it. Now they, they say you shouldn't, you should never, you should never go go live with, um, is it with, with children and animals? Doing it doing it live with the internet is even worse. So let, let's see how this goes. So the idea of the storylines, I'm clearly picking my best one here now, is. They kind of look a bit like a lecture. And bear in mind we produce these ourselves. I'll just shut him up. Whoever he is. <laughs> Good looking chap though, don't you think? So... I mean, all this does have done with sort of simple technology that we've, we've put together ourselves. But in some senses, it's like a lecture. But what our students really like about it is that you can stop it at any time and go back and listen to the whole thing again. But it means that we can do some things which I think are actually really good teaching practice. So here's an example of the kind of philosophy behind them. Is what we do is we... Isn't this a simple slide? Right? It's just a very simple statement. There are two ways to classify neurons written by a pen. It doesn't need to be high tech. You can do it functionally or morphologically. Be careful what I say because I've got Andy Jones here. He's going to shoot me down in a minute. <laughs> so a very simple idea. And you can remember that and it sticks in your mind because it's not much to remember. But the user is actually, or the student, is invited to click on either of these and then a bit more information comes up. And then they can explore at the next level and look around and see, for example, what the different types of neurons are. 
So it's kind of like unpacking something. You know those Us- Usborne books? Anybody with children here? You know, the, the nice simple picture, all the flaps open up and there's a flap within a flap. It's kind of like Usborne books for undergraduates, really, the sort of idea. But the reason why I think it's good is because you can explore the concepts interactively. And I think, you know, it's a bit like at the zoo. If you put the food in a plate, the animal gets bored. If you hide it, they kind of... Well, maybe we shouldn't sort of draw a comparison with undergraduate animals in a zoo, but you just kind of get the point. <coughs> but can you, can you see that the, um, the structure is still left there? And there's tons of stuff you can do. You can put in, you can put in movies. You can have little points of interest for them to look up. You can have quite complicated pictures, like this one. And again, they can look things up, click on the different neurons. That's actually a really bad picture for teaching, but you get the point. And the amazing thing is, when you get this articulate storyline, you can get it, it's quite expensive, but you can cut, cut a deal with them. We managed to get them down to £300 a copy. You get it and install it, you think, great, I've just been ripped off, I've just paid 300 quid for PowerPoint. But that's, you'll notice there's another couple of ribbons there. And believe me, people without any programming experience can very quickly get to the stage where they're producing this. So I'm not talking about you'll need to get a graphic designer in. I'm talking about anybody in this room, I guarantee within half an hour can produce material just like this. It's really, really easy to use. It's all wizards and boxes and dialogue boxes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're using an articulate already, are you? Yeah. No, no, they're really hard to deal with. Actually, they're really hard to get a deal out of them. So yeah, no. The other thing that you can do is you can actually make these, you can structure your course in a very interactive way. So here's a case going back to the kidney module again. I mentioned earlier about pH and not teaching something they already know. Here's a situation where we're teaching them about the basics of acid-base balance in the kidney. And as you know, I'm sure you're experts on kidney acid-base balance, but... If I want to sit down with a student and teach them about the way the kidney works, the way it handles pH, watch this. this Isn't that clever? (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) I just realised I start more within this section. (laughs) So, you've got a student and you don't know whether they understand about pH anyway. If they do understand about pH, you don't want to bother teaching them. If they don't understand it, you've got to teach them. So what we typically do is we'll give them a question We just want to see how much you already know about acids and bases. The concentration of free hydrogen ions in a solution is 0.001 molar. What's the pH of the solution? If you don't know the answer to that, you're not going to guess it. So I'm going to be deliberately stupid now. I I think that means it's 8. And I hit submit. And what happens is, I get this dialog box saying, no, that's not right, this is how you work out the pH. You really need to know pH if you're going to understand the kidney. So we're going to take you now to the, another storyline that will cover it for you. And if I click that, it will take me to another module. Right? So the whole idea is that you can reuse material and direct students around it. So basically that's kind of like student, student-led no, it's not. It's student-reactive or student-centred, I think is the right word. Student-centred teaching, which I think is a good idea. So then at the end, once they've done all that, they've done the storylines, we give them quizzes, learnings, and, uh, uh, quizzes, workshops, things to get them to think a little bit more deeply, and we can measure the learning outcome using Moodle Logs. So typically, I might simply re-give them the same, qu- same quiz questions again, or maybe a different quiz question. We might get them the one I showed you, where they have to write their own report, or they do a, a Moodle workshop. It's all on Moodle. There's nothing fancy or extra in there. And then, the last thing that I want to point out is 
is the use of forums in blended learning. I think it's absolutely central. It's incredibly valuable. It means that the students not only get benefit from each other, they encourage each other to think. And as tutors, you can also monitor what's going on and participate in the right way. We don't tell them answers on the forums. We try to raise the level of discussion. So if someone asks a simple question like, oh, do the principal cells of the kidney have such and such a receptor? We would say, well, would you expect it to have it? And provoke, provoke a bit of discussion like that. Well, if they've raised a problem, I think that X, Y, Z is such and such, we might say, well, what's the counterpoint to that? Just to show you the kind of level of engagement, these are the first year, first two terms from our first year. We've had a total of 880 discussions and 3,000 posts, and that's between 50 students. It's great because we can also we can see, we can see evidence of active learning in there as well, and the quality is surprisingly high. So this this was on a, this was on a module on what we call foundations, which is just to take them through the body very quickly in four weeks. Someone says, oh, I, I, I watch the tutorials and I'm wondering if progesterone supplements could prevent miscarriages and what would happen if there's too much progesterone. That's not on the syllabus, right? So they're starting to think for themselves and they've made a prediction. What would happen if there's too much progesterone? So they're thinking systems, right? Someone then, oh, this, these are meant to be hidden, by the way, so ignore the names. Progesterone levels re rise and remain high. I would say that, so the speculation there based on their knowledge, the issue of causing miscarriage um, is professional. If it's caused by progesterone differency, then it would work. But there are other things that are here. That's what I'm talking about. Most, most, most uh, miscarriages are caused by DNA problems, genetic, genetic problems, nothing to do with progesterone. So they're speculating. And then there's another response. They so say, yes, I, I've seen a similar kind of thing too. Maybe we could. This was in, I think, about the second week of the first term. So that's how quickly they rise to, to using forums. So I'll just go through it very quickly because I know we want to. So when you've done all that online, the kind of stuff you can do with them face to face is really very high level because you've seen already just how, how rapidly they rise up to, do you rise up to deep learning? Does that make sense, does it? Sink to deep learning, that sounds awful. <laughs> or progress to deep learning, maybe we'll put it that way. So the kind of things we do is we have, we, we concentrate on so-called soft skills. I know that sounds a bit sort of Google in California, but I think they are actually important. They met, they're a lot of what makes a good scientist. But the thing is they're using, they're using their knowledge in a way which very much re anticipates what they'd be doing in the workplace. So all these kind of things we want to get across to them. And we, we do it through a series. So this is the one we've got set up at the moment. Uh, we give them a treasure hunt on the very first day where they have to look for famous names around um, uh, Hampstead Heath. Um, art of writing, invention. Oops. Oh, it's one of those. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> yeah, so with, with their invention, what they have to do is in the first term, they have to come up with a theoretical invention which doesn't have to be practically doable but is based on sound science. And they do that as a team and they compete with the best invention. And it's things like an artificial liver. You know, nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing too ambitious in an artificial liver. And then they have like Dragon's Den where they're told, if you had so much money, how would you spend it in a medical context? Uh, they're taught how to, we teach our students how to write. That sounds kind of weird, but I think it's important. And, and so on. And here's an example of the, of the artificial level. We encourage creativity. So these guys decided not to do PowerPoint. They got a shoebox and cut out the cells to illustrate how when, when the material goes through this artificial membrane, it would be filtered. And all, all these things stand for specific enzymes and things. So I, I was quite pleased with what they came up with, with that one. Uh, here, here they're working on... They, they got hold of... This, this team got an Arduino device, which is like, kind of like a... Uh, an interface between Raspberry Pi and a robotic system to build an osmometer. So that, again, these, these are first years. Uh, the one challenge was to create an osmometer. So that these are the Arduino, but these, these came up with the idea of using eggs to create an osmometer. And the final challenge was they had to measure the osmotic pressure in a liquid. That was the only thing they were told. You had to find a way of measuring the osmotic pressure in a liquid and to get it within a certain tolerance. And the winner was not the Arduino, the eggs, <laughs> I think was the winner on this one. 
But you can imagine the kind of teaching environment that you're talking about here. I mean, there's, there's, you can get the wrong idea that this kind of looks a bit Montessori, you know, a bit sort of <laughs> A-level, or sort of, you know, media studies, practical lab or something like that. The, the science behind it is actually really, really quite, quite robust. So just to remind you, that, that's, the, that's the general overall structure of what we do. And the last thing I want to mention is the practicalities of it, because you might be thinking, yeah, this is great, but you've got dedicated teaching fellows and so on. Yes, yes, it's true. It's very, well, somewhere here I should make the point that it's very front-loaded. It takes a lot at the beginning to create a flipped module. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of work. But the point is, is once you've done it, you've got it. And you don't need to do it again. You just need to update it. Um, we're now in our second year, and we are now spending... We're not actually creating a lot of new material now. We're just updating our material, improving it, because we did it in such a rush. Having the template with the pre-learning, learning and post-learning really speeds things up. We can now produce modules actually quite quickly. We've learned that we've got to have lead partners. We've got part the learning lead, that's me. You have to have someone who's interested in teaching partner up with module leads because people leading modules tend to be not that interested in teaching. So the trick is actually getting experts out there very, very good at biology but don't know how to teach and getting the expertise from them into the storylines. And that's the biggest challenge that we've had. At the moment, what we do is we take lecturers, we, we look at their PowerPoints, and we tell them, that's rubbish. You've got 50 PowerPoints there. Take it down to five. And they love being told that. <laughs> they don't, actually. They really hate it. Um, and then we go and film them when they got it right. We go and film them, we green screen them, turn it into storyline. It takes about eight hours to produce a 15-minute storyline in total. So, no, eight hours to produce a one-hour one hour storylines. Um, when we get the lecturers to provide the quizzes and that leaves no oh, I've done it again that leaves the teaching fellows to work on things like house activities and forums and tutorials I think that's pretty much what I wanted to get across today actually yeah that's, that's it brilliant ok so that's it that's, that's how you make a blended module <laughs> Do you have any questions? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I'm, I'm actually interested in the ones you showed the um, various different forums that I have students engaged with. I'm interested in the sense of students are actually getting engaged, and obviously you will get some students who are absolutely yeah. you know, spend all their time on it. Um, I'm not sure the sense of students are actually engaged. Not everybody, not all students. Like online learning, so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. Online learning is not uh, the, not everybody engages in the forums. It's probably it's, I could think of two or three students who hardly ever go on the forums, and we're constantly chasing them up. One of them annoyingly did well in his exams, which kind of <laughs> undermine my entire educational theory. But there we go. Um, we we actually give them 10% of the mark for contributing online, of which forums are a part. But we didn't actually need to do that for most of them. Most of them actually really like it. One deterrent, actually, while I'm on the topic, is that the excellence that you see in some of them can be a deterrent to the less able students. And so it takes a lot of you know, encouragement to say to them, just, just, just post something. You know, don't, don't be afraid that you, you can't give these beautiful answers that the others can give. But yeah, I think it's just part of teaching students to express themselves. A lot of them are very reluctant. It's the same in tutorials. You, know, you have a student, some students who won't say anything. I wouldn't even tell you the name, <laughs> you know. But it's, it's just part of learning how to do that. Yeah. But actually quite the, the range, the number of students that participate to, to, to a decent amount is quite quite higher than we were expected, actually. We've got three new programs that are rolling out that they won't say they're using a template but they're adopting most of what we're doing or they're taking on some of the ob learning objects that we're creating or they're simply taking some of our modules as part of their program. So it's a bit of a piecemeal thing at the moment. It's just taking time to get the message out there a bit. Thank you.
Yeah, pretty much. It's, it's often the same sorts of things as we did in the pre-learning. And sometimes deliberately so, so that the students make a, okay, yeah, make a link between what they started out with and what they learned. So very often I'll have the identical quiz to what they had during the pre-learning phase, so we can directly measure, get the students to think about how they're doing. Um, but we tend to like things, tend to shy away from multiple choice questions, that kind of thing, and get them more to discussion type documents. Or it might be create a wiki page, or workshops, you know, where they, they create a submission and they, they criticise each other's work. There's actually a lot you can do in Moodle, which, you know, if you spend time, just have a look at around those activities. Quite a lot of stuff that quite used to use. Yes, I do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to republish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I tend to shy away from the lesson like features of Articulate Storyline and just use the kind of exploratory stuff because that isn't going to change that much. But a well, the, the, I find that the Moodle lessons, if they're used well and you remember where you are in the lessons. <laughs> Are, qu are probably easier to use in some respects than story. It, you know, I, I keep telling my teaching fellows that there's nothing magical about articulate storyline or any one of, there's nothing magic about multiple choice questions. You've got to be aware of what you can do, what the tools are you can use. And then you've got to be aware of what you want to teach. And then it's, you know, it takes a lot of imagination and creativity to say what is the best way to teach it. And if the best way of doing it is going down to a lab with an iPhone and filming someone saying, explain to me what PCR is in two minutes. That's fine, because I don't think glitz equality matters. It's having the right material for the job that you're trying to teach and what you're trying to teach. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Storylines and tutorials. That's what they, that's what they value most. They're kind of the mainstay. Some of that, I think, is like um, a traditional thinking on their part as well, because it's kind of easy to relate to that. And other students and other mod, sorry, other courses, maybe, are, you know, we all know what a lecture's like, and the storyline's easy to kind of relate to that. And some of the other things, it's m maybe it's not as obvious to them why they're doing it, and it's not for us to teach them the value of those things. Yeah, storylines really highly rated. Tutorials are really high rated. Practicals kind of just below that. And the rest is kind of like a, a sludge at the bottom of the mountains, really. Andy? What kind of um, tutorial do students We, uh, yeah, that's, that's a bit. Our student numbers are increasing and our teaching fellows aren't. At the moment, we have between 10 and 12 in a tutorial. Um, Oxford and Cambridge are kind of used to two or three, which is complete. Even going up to 12 changes things a lot. But we'll often do things like we'll set a problem and then tell them to work in small groups and hover from group to group. That works particularly well. We're also working on design for what I call mega tutorials where actually have the whole cohort there, all 50 students. But we'll work together on a task which is then broken down into different parts. So the whole tutorial kind of lasts a day. So you have them in the morning. You say, okay, our job today is we want to find a cure for disease X. Okay, one team is going to go and work on this area of the disease. And we're going to come back at 2 o'clock, progress report. Each person's going to report on it. Go back away, write a, Wiki, write a Wikipedia page on it, whatever. So lots of different ways of doing You know, The tutorial is one method of doing some jobs. But there's lots of other things you can teach as well, which don't require that high ratio. But, yeah, that would be the idea. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't tried that yet, but that's kind of like, like for next year. The other thing is, is having mentoring schemes, you know, where you sort of meet, meet small groups of students for once, twice, three times a term. So you still get that kind of close contact. That makes a huge difference as well. Okay, thanks very much for listening. Yeah. <laughs>